All right. Okay. Um, I will open the meeting at 6.05. Thank you. Um, so I'll ask, uh, we'll have our public comment period if there's anyone from the public. Audio is not working. You can't hear me? I can hear you. Oh. Can you hear you? Okay, so um, I don't know if there's anyone else from the public that's here that wants to no. talk. I know that Anna is here, but she's on the agenda in several places. So I, I don't know if you have anything. <laughs> Martha, no one's in the chat room. Okay. It's just us. Okay. Um, all right, so I'll first uh, ask for a motion to approve the February minutes. Um, I don't know if everyone had a chance to look at them, if there were any um, changes. I know a couple people got back to me and I think Janet did a great job. So if there's a, if I can have a motion to approve those. I move to approve. Second. Second from Jeremy. Okay, and uh, we'll do a roll call on that. So I'm just going to read out your name and you repeat your name and say um, you approve. So all in favor, in favor, Tova. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Uh, Sam. Sam Nordberg. Aye. Uh, Pat. Patricia Purdy. Yes. Jeremy. Jeremy Gross. Yes. Uh, Janet. Yes. Janet Burt. Yes. And Martha Brennan. Yes. So that's a unanimous approval on the minutes. Okay. So our first item to discuss and did Anna disappear? Oh no, she's there. You just moved on my, you moved on my screen is uh, to discuss a, a proposal from the Han Hamilton Wenham Human Rights Coalition uh, for pride flags and a flag raising. So Anna, I'll turn it over to you at this point. Great, thank you, Martha. Thank you, everybody. Um, so uh, as always, I appreciate your time and support of all these issues. Um, the Human Rights Coalition has been hard at work on a variety of proposals in getting ready for the next few months of programming. And one of the big ones we wanted to talk to you about was uh, in and around Pride, which is the month of June. And last year, I think people know the town of Lenin really knocked it out of the park. Anthony um, outdid himself with the lights on town hall and a flag raising, and it was a great triumph. So. We sort of have two requests related to pride programming. One of them is that you do that again. <laughs> we would like to have you uh, raise the pride flag and light up town hall if you're so willing. Um, and we're sort of proposing that happen from June 1st to June um, 18th specifically. We'll get to the reason why in a moment. And then somewhat related, uh, we applied for and received a Mass Cultural Council grant to purchase more pride flags. And you know how there's um, the flag holders on 1A that we often use for Memorial Day, 4th of July, Veterans Day. We would like to request use of those same flag holders for pride flags for um, part of the month of June as well. So we felt like we needed to come to you for your permission to do those things. Okay, so I'm gonna open it to discussion. I think the role of, the, of our committee in this would be to um, have a motion that we would encourage and recommend that the Board of Selectmen approve this, right? Anna, you'd be going to them next. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think procedurally, I, I, you guys tell me, but procedurally that sort of makes sense. Last year when we did it, uh, it went through Anthony's office directly um, and that worked well, but uh, we didn't include the, the 1A component was just for the municipal flag raising. So um, things are different this year, partly because Anthony's not here and also because you exist. So it made sense right. to sort of start here. Guys, I apologize. Did we lose Kevin? Oh, we did. He was here, maybe. It says, it says Town of Wenham. Is he there? Oh. Well, that's that's Tom. Oh, okay. I'm here. There's like, two oh, Town of Wenham me. windows. Oh, there's yeah. a second Town of Wenham wisdom window. I see. And maybe that. I, I don't know. No, he was there. No, he was there with, under his own right. name, I thought. Maybe he had to step away for a second. He was having an issue with his um, earlier. Okay. So, Point of order, we should just continue then, Tom, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I think we, we have, have a quorum. quorum. Okay, yeah. great. So do people have questions about how that would work or what our role is or um, just general discussion about yay for pride flags? I mean, I think it would make a great statement to see those flags on 1A and um, just 
in terms of making people feel welcome and recognized. And um, as Anna mentioned, it was great to see the, the colored lights last year. I felt like it was the White House. Mm -hmm. It was. When they, marriage, when they passed marriage equality and I was like, wow, Wenham is really stepping up with the colored yeah. lights. Yes, Tom? Yes, Martha. I believe what Anne is probably looking for is the committee to support it, to submit it to my office for final approval. So I believe that's what she- Yeah, I, I, I recognize that. I just wanted to give one on the committee a chance to, to ask a question of Anna or of you about it before we go to a motion. I don't see how this isn't a no brainer. I <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. I just wanted to, you know, provide the space for people to ask a question. So I will entertain a motion that the Wenham Human Rights Committee recommends and encourages the Board of Selectmen to support the request of the Han Hamilton Wenham Human Rights Coalition to install pride flags and to on 1A and to conduct, conduct a flag raising in support of Pride Month, June 1, 1st through the 18th. So moved. I'll second. Any discussion? All right, I'll go to the, uh, so all in favor, and I'll start now that the boxes have moved around, Sam. <laughs> Sam Nordberg, aye. Pat. Pat, Patricia Purdy, aye. Jeremy. Jeremy Gross, aye. Tova. Tova Crystal, aye. Janet. Janet Bird, aye. And Martha Brennan, aye. So that passes unanimously. Um, oh, so there's Kevin. Kevin's here now. <laughs> Hi, Kevin. Welcome back. Um, Thanks. I was having audio problems. Sorry about that. Oh, guys. okay. That's great. Okay. So we're going to move to um, the next item. So Kevin, you missed, we voted unanimously to support a request of the Hamilton Wenham Human Rights Coalition to install pride flags on 1A. Awesome. And, um, do a pride flag raising. And so that request will move now to the Board of Selectmen. Awesome. That's great. Um, so since it's the theme of the night is flags, um, Anna, would you like to put the, and I've included this in the packet, there's a request of the June, the North Shore Juneteenth Association for a flag raising. And you probably know that uh, Charlie Baker signed last year um, a law to make Juneteenth an official Massachusetts holiday, so. Right, thanks Martha. So sort of similar to that, the reason our request for Pi flags was uh, state specific, We've been working with the North Shore Juneteenth Association, who's been conducting flag raisings across the North Shore for a few years, but it's really gained steam um, looking up to this year, which as Martha said, is the first year it's an official state holiday, which is amazing. So we have forwarded to you a request really from them, or more the local partner, it's really the association's uh, project, that they would like to have municipalities across the North Shore raise and fly the Juneteenth flag from June 19th through the 25th, I think it is, uh, 26th, a week there um, at municipalities and sort of similar structure, we have a raising. Um, they also have sort of a program that they could offer that involves the uh, Black American National Anthem, a speaker, poetry, um, opportunity for local remarks. So there's a little bit of programming to sort of explain because a lot of people don't know what this is all about. Um, so there's a visibility ask there. I'll also let you know that the coalition will be submitting another mass cultural grant. Um, and we've also applied for a different grant as well. So we're hoping to do some programming in the month of June specifically in partnership with the North Shore Juneteenth Association to talk about the history of Juneteenth and also potentially the history of slavery right here in Hamilton Wenham and sort of the abolitionist movement to sort of not just be a performative flag raising but actually some educational content as well. So we're working on some grant funding for that. Um, but this particular ask is of the town itself to again um, hoist the flag uh, from the 19th to the, I wanna get the date right, I think it's the 25th or 26th. The 26th, 19th through the 26th. Um, and that is sort of a similar visibility request uh, of you tonight. Anna, could I ask you to repeat those dates because I miss them? Sure, so Juneteenth is June 19th. So the request yeah. from the North Shore Juneteenth Association is from June 19 to June 26. Thank you. I think I had that wrong in the agenda. I put it through the end of the month. So. I mean, you could do it for that. There, the coordinated request of all the municipalities are those particular dates. Um, and then administratively, this is one question, I think, you know, for the town managers and, uh, you know, the chief and others to work out. 
some municipalities have multiple flagpoles and so you could potentially have multiple flags going at the same time i'm not sure if we have the capacity to do that or not so you know you potentially if you can have the pride flag and the juneteenth flag below the american flag so it's an etiquette i think that would probably be more ideal but i don't know about our we'll have to do a little bit of flag logistics to figure this out if it goes forward which i I know that we could do, um, but that was a question that's come up in some places in terms of how many flagpoles do they have, where do they put it, and you know why. So that's sort of the minutia. I feel like that could be worked out. So this is more of a conceptual ask if this is something the town wants to support. I'm not sure think? that we have a town vexillologist, um, <laughs> but there's probably <laughs> someone who operates in that capacity. Well, flag etiquette is pretty strict. The, nothing can hide, nothing can be above the American flag. Like right. that's important. So that, you know, that will dictate. And then depending on that, you know, there are other flags that fly in different orders. So again, I do think that's something that I'm sure town management could figure out properly um, <laughs> if we want to move forward. So is, um, since this is just a municipal ask, is this something that has to go to the Board of Selectmen or is this something that can just be requested of the town manager? Uh, Generally, in my history, it's generally gone before me. I'll speak with Gary. It shouldn't be, you know, once I get the request, it shouldn't be that difficult. So are you looking for a written request or will these motions suffice as the request? Uh, a written request is good always for our records. Okay. Is that something you'd like me to provide or Martha to provide once it comes out of here? A little bit of both or what would be best for you? It can it can come from either Anna. Okay. As long I as can I can do from... take that Anna. Okay. If you want, can... I'll let you. Okay. Thank you. you no, know, you have you have a little bit on your plate. I'm guessing. Um, is there any other questions about um, Juneteenth flag? I think it's a great. I I love the um, the history component to it, Anna. Mm -hmm. I hope you can do something. Oh no, June. The kids will be out of school, but. I, I think that's really important to have the history too. Yeah, well, it's it's potentially going to be part. We're working on a whole webinar series for both our. We have a, a youth education action subcommittee and an adult education action subcommittee, and so this would be something to sort of put forward as part of that. So, um, you know, we don't ideally moving forward just to plant the seed in a non-COVID era. You know, this would be a celebration. We would have a community yeah. event. You'd have food and vendors and music, and it would be right. you know, yeah. but. COVID, I don't think that's realistic even this year. So um, as part of that, we really do want to have an educational opportunity because I do think a lot of people have no idea what Juneteenth no idea. is, what right. it means or why it matters. So I think, again, as a coalition, and I think, you know, the town, I would think, shares this, we're trying to avoid things that are purely performative hollow gestures. So, you know, sure, we could fly a flag and say nothing and everyone's like, wow, what's that flag there? Like, we need the education to make it meaningful. So... That's sort of part of our goal here. And I think if the, and if it comes from different avenues too, I think it would be nice if it was, you know, if it comes from like say the police social media aspect of it too. So mm -hmm. all, all different components are kind of supporting it in their own way which, instead of it just coming from our body. I yeah. think that would come off pretty cool. Yeah, um, that's a great idea to have sort of amplify the social media by putting it on multiple channels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think it's it's helpful that it really is a state holiday. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. it's yeah. not as though we're inventing something that hasn't been officially sanctioned for many years. Um, and it's nice that the state has recognized it. So, I know there's a lot of good. Um, I just went to a presentation on Friday from the Cape Ann Museum in mm -hmm. Boston about um, the history of African Americans and on the North Shore. And it was there's tons of resources out there in terms of educating about the subject, so. Yeah, well, and part of what we might condition, um, commission with some of that grant funding is to actually have a historian locally take a really close look at these two communities in particular, because I think there is some programming happening about Cape Ann in general, but I haven't seen a lot that's like really specific mm -hmm. to our community. Right. And the um, Historic Beverly right now has a, um, has an online presentation that you can see of, of uh, slavery in Beverly. Mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, still not Hamilton Wenham, but it's very interesting. It's closer, but I think, I think uh, here, getting... yeah, well, we're trying really hard to um, be hyper-local in a certain way, you know, right. like really look out for what's going on here in Hamilton and Wenham, um, because there are so many good programs happening in different places, mm -hmm. but people want to know, well, what happened here? And I think that's a really, I think that's right. important. And I know that in a lot of times people think, well, slavery didn't happen here. That was in the South, but... <laughs> 
that's not true. So yeah. <laughs> it's, um, there's a lot of interesting stories out there. And in, even people who petitioned the Massachusetts General Court for their freedom and were able to get that. So there's just a lot of interesting things going on. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, in the interest of time, I will entertain a motion that the Wenham Human Rights Committee recommends and encourages the town and or the Board of Selectmen, if that's necessary, to support the flag raising request of the North Shore Juneteenth Association to raise a Juneteenth flag from June 19th through the 26th. Does someone say so moved? Oh, so wow. moved. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can't make the motion. I can just ask for it. Uh, a second? Second. second. Okay, I'm going to do the roll call. Sam? M. Nordberg, aye. Pat? Trisha Purdy, aye. Jeremy? Jeremy Gross, aye. Tova? Tova Crystal, aye. Kevin? Kevin DiNapoli, aye. And Janet? Janet Bird, aye. And Martha is an aye. That's unanimous. Okay, we're going to move on to the next. Um, topic. And so Anna, you can introduce Everett and Great. discussing the um, Indigenous Land Acknowledgement Proposal. Great. Thanks, Martha. So this is really, I'm just the, um, the introducer here. This is really the work product of EJ Everett, who is a student at the high school, is a member of the Social Justice Club. So Everett approached me, uh, boy, I don't know, maybe two months ago, it was a while ago, with an idea about land acknowledgement, both at the municipal level and the school district level. So to be honest, I am the, um, the adult who is trying to help Everett realize this dream, um, but it's really their work. And so Everett's prepared an amazing uh, presentation for you to describe what it is and why it matters. So I'd like to actually introduce Everett and let them take it over. So just before we do that, does Everett need uh, to be a host so that they can share screen? I think I can. Whoops. Whoever has control can just uh, open up screen sharing to everybody. Okay. Right. There we go. That. Nice. All right. Um, so thanks for having me. I'm Everett with the Hamilton Social Justice Club, the high school. And yeah, I'm going to be presenting on this policy of land acknowledgement and this is kind of the ask that I'll be presenting to the boards of selects and also the school district. Uh, so uh, an example of this would be we would like to begin by acknowledging the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth of Massachusetts have taken their name. We would like to pay our respect to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historical Massachusetts tribe territories to this day. And that is the statement that the Massachusetts tribe would like us to read. They would like people to read before events or gatherings on uh, the lands that was historically theirs. So that's one example. And that's what a statement of land acknowledgement looks like, but a more formal definition is that they are a simple and powerful way to show respect to the original inhabitants of the land where you're currently standing, presenting, or about to engage in an activity. Usually you would read it at the very start, but I just read it at the start of my presentation. Um, the Massachusetts Center for Native American Awareness believes this is a meaningful step towards honoring the truth, making the invisible visible, and correcting the American stories that enrage and erase indigenous people's tribal history and culture. Uh, so that quote is a, a more in-depth definition, and it also gets into why it is important. Uh, one of the reasons that it's very easy to think that, you know, this all happened in the past because Native people are rarely in the history books other than when their land is being taken. But, you know, the Massachusetts tribe is still around, and, like, there are also things such as you know, health disparities, reservations have been hit really hard by COVID disproportionately. And that's also something you can trace back to the history <laughs> of how the United States um, got its land. And uh, so it's not just in the past and that this statement can help people remember that. And it's also a tragedy, just like we remember more recent things like the Holocaust and 9-11. We never want this to happen again. So um, yeah, it's important to remember the lives that were lost and displaced and 
the harm that was done and you know culture destroyed um, that took place and reflecting can also inspire action like every time you take half a minute out of your day if you are leading a meeting and you present and you read the statement it can make you think like what is my relation to the land like you know what am i am i doing things to help people you know what can i do to make sure there are less health disparities um and it can also introduce the idea to other people who may have not never even heard of the idea of a land acknowledgement and it can also be a direct connection to local history because Masconoma is buried in Hamilton. And uh, there's a few places locally, very locally that have done it. Um, there's quite a few educational facilities that have done it, especially higher education, but there's also municipalities like Great Barrington, Winchester, and Salem. Um, so the asks that I'll be making are physical we will be making our physical markers on school campuses and town halls so people know where this land is in more ways than just one. Uh, and for Pingree and Patton Park, the same thing. So uh, people know more of the history of the land and not, you know, they might know how it was bought, but not, but not who it was bought from. Um, and there's also, we would like statements on the school district and town websites. So if people are trying to learn about our schools or about our towns, then they would know. And um, also we would be reading the acknowledgement statement that I read at the beginning before community gatherings and major events, like the flag raisings mentioned, that would be included in that. Also civic events like Veterans Memorial Day or town meetings. In, a, in the schools that would look like open houses and play productions, that sort of thing, times when the community is coming together. And it does include virtual events because most people are going to be zooming in from Massachusetts land. And the Hamilton Women's Social Justice Club can provide funding. Are there any questions? Yeah, I, I have a question. Everett, thank you so much for doing this. I belong to other organizations that uh, do an indigenous land acknowledgement. And I think it's a very appropriate thing. My question is about, um, is Patton Park, does it belong to the town or does it belong to the uh, Village Improvement Society, the Women's Village Improvement Society? No, it, no, Patton Park belongs to the town of Wenham. Okay, and Pingree Park Not as Patton well? Patton Park, I mean the town of Hamilton, I'm sorry. And Pingree Park as well? When I'm okay, so yeah, okay. Then I, I, I have no problem with, I have no problem with this as long as these are town-run spaces. Um, I, you know, that's I, I think that's fine. Yeah. Everett, do you want to um, stop the screen share so everyone can see each other a little bit more effectively? Everett, I had a question about um, the last bullet point on that last slide said that the Hamilton Wenham Social Justice Club would be providing the funding for the plaques. Yeah, well, we got a grant recently. Oh, that's great. And the, the, the Ed Fund, the Ed Fund provided a grant and then, you know, I'll also offered the, the Human Rights Coalition is happy to help with it as well. But again, this is really, this is really student led, which is beautiful. I mean, that's the best yeah. part of it, so. And, and Agret, have you gone to the school yet? Mm -hmm. Have they given any kind of a response to this? Um, I mean, the principal, Mr. Tracy, has been pretty on board. Um, I don't know if there's been any response from higher ups like the school committee. Mm -hmm. um, but the answer to that is not yet. I'm hoping to get it on the agenda. Uh, this was sort of our first trial run of this. So um, Arthur was very gracious to sort of start here. So uh, this is the first time we've presented this, but. Awesome. Mm -hmm. cool. Thank Anna, you. would it help you on the school board if the Human Rights Committee gave this its full backing? Would that give you, would that help assist you? Um, so, you know, trying to be careful what hat I wear here. So um, 
I can't speak for the full school committee um, yeah. or the district. Uh, I can say in my individual capacity as an individual school committee member that I would obviously support this. Um, I do think that one of the things Everett and I have, have as, as we've been researching this together in some ways, uh, you know, it's, 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 there's an, an element to avoid tokenism of doing this again in a performative way. And the more that you could integrate this thinking and philosophy across all manner of, you know, sort of operations is helpful. So I think on a high level, I would like to say that if the town is doing it, the district would as well. Legally, they are separate entities and I can't speak on behalf of the whole school committee, obviously. So the goal would be to bring it before the school committee. And if the rest of the committee supports it, then, you know, that would be helpful, but it's hard to say. Is there a process of, of how they're going to go um, about designing the plaques? Have, have, or has it not gotten to that level yet? Uh, we're not there yet. It would ideally be something personalized to us. Like that was, there was that statement from the Massachusetts tribe that the plaque would probably be something more specific to our towns. Mm -hmm. Um, what I will say in researching other municipalities and districts that have done this, um, there's typically, and you can see this on the, especially the, um, the colleges have done a, a pretty really elegant job. It's, it's, you have sort of the statement and having gotten the language from the tribe itself is very helpful because again, who am I to say what the land acknowledgement should say? Like, that's not my business to say that. So I think there's an element of sort of hearing from, um, current members of the Massachusetts tribal nation is important. Um, but what I will say is, yeah, places sort of take it a little bit more personal. So here in our community, you know, Mass Conoma is buried, I know it's a Hamilton, we're in Wenham, but, you know, sort of very similar community. And I think there is a local tie-in there as well, uh, but they are sort of more personalized, the statements. Um, in terms of designing the plaque and signage, what I will say is one district that's done it really well is down in Mashpee, which of course has an active tribal nation right there. So they have this amazing partnership. We obviously don't have that because we don't have an active community right here in the same way, but in the same way that they have like the American flag and the clock, they have a land acknowledgement in every single classroom so that when kids are looking at the clock, they're looking at the land acknowledgement. And um, so, you know, they've sort of put it up that way. Um, and that's the kind of thing we're thinking potentially could be in the school district buildings or in town hall, you know, when you come in and you have sort of plaques and signage, that could be something that could be designed. So I think that would be a partnership, in my opinion, to sort of figure out what, what works for us. Um, and this is sort of, this is newish. I think um, Tom found the example from Great Barrington. I will say I spent the better part of Oh, I'll just give a ballpark, 20 hours trying to find examples of communities and places that have done this. And it is relatively new and it's hard to find evidence of it. I think it happens, you know, I mean, like tonight is a good example. Someone would have to work really hard to find out that Everett gave a land acknowledgement at the beginning of this meeting, you know, so it's happening, but it's not obviously happening. So um, I've done some outreach to the MCNAA. Um, there's a professor at UMass, um, Boston, who's very involved. There's another amazing nonprofit that's Boston based called the Upstander Project that's been doing programming and they actually make these amazing posters that say you are indigenous land. So it's something, you know, it's, it's catching on. Uh, Winchester is a municipality, did it first at their uh, summer town meeting. And I think Great Barrington was similar. I don't know, maybe Mr. Younger can, can wait in here. I feel like Great Barrington's was within the last year as well. October, 2020. Yeah, and um, Salem did a whole bunch of programming in and around Indigenous Peoples Day this last October. So our timing is sort of right on, you know, it's new, but it's, it's, it is, it's been building for a number of years. So um, it seems like the timing would be good if, if this passed and then we'd be sort of in position to do some programming in October of 2021, mm -hmm. you know, since we have enough notice. Other questions? So, um, oh, go ahead. No, no, go. Um, just a just a couple. Everett, thank you for uh, for the presentation and and to you and your group for doing this work. Um, are there any particularly meaningful landmarks outside of sort of public spaces that we that we should also be considering acknowledging? Um, you know, I don't I don't know if there are any sort of histor historically important 
um, spots in in Hamilton or Wenham, but that would that would also be an interesting way of of trying to personalize things a bit more. Like if there are stories or history or or something like that to to further ground this um, for us, I think that could also be really really of interest. Not that I know of at the moment. Now, have you been in touch with the like Massachusetts tribe leaders at all, like directly, or is this coming from like resources that they provide? Uh, I we, we sent an email through their website and got a response, so we okay. sent a few mm-hmm. emails back and forth. Yeah, Everett sort of put me on the the trail, and then I um, I've had two or three exchanges with Thomas Green, who is the vice president of the Massachusetts tribe, um, who was was grateful that we reached out to sort of confirm the language um, directly. So okay. um, one, one thing we did explore, uh, w- which again is sort of customizing. Um, and I think this is a really important thing to note, you know, our Western sort of colonial European sentiment is like, well, here's Hamilton, here's one and here's Topsfield. Like there's a delineation of space. And one of the things that's a little bit tricky about where we are geographically is that we're very close to where the sort of Penacook from the north historically would come down. And then of course, Masconomet was, um, was a sagamore of the Agawam who are sort of a cousin relation of the Pawtucket, which are part of the Massachusetts. So it gets really complicated. And I think that one of the things that we'll have to tread very carefully on is really understanding as, you know, as well-intentioned, thoughtful white people, like, it's really difficult to not superimpose our sentiment of like, well, here's, where's the divider? Where does it go? And the reality is where we are geographically within Massachusetts is very close to where different indigenous groups have overlapped for, you know, 10,000 years. It's not like there was a, a firm line in the sand. So one of the things we did talk with Mr. Green about was, are there any other groups that we have to name specifically? Um, to avoid either accidentally excluding someone or not. And his response was rather definitive that, that all groups in this area would have been subject to Massachusetts tribal bloodline sachems from pre-colonial to present. So I think that's something that I'll want to personally talk more carefully with him about and other members and just sort of make sure that we're being inclusive um, but also respectful again that we've got that language from the tribe itself. So mm-hmm. I personally will confess, I am very reticent to suggest that I know better than the tribe. Like I actually won't do that. So I think there's a matter of sort of doing the research and making sure it works for our community in a localized way and yet respects that we are not the authorities of these lands, if that makes sense. I don't know if Everett wants to add any more. I know you spent a lot of time thinking about that too, but. Yeah, just, I think this is an area where we have to not be perfectionistic and take the first step and like maybe five years from now someone's like oh we heard you're doing this land acknowledgement and we want to be included and Mm -hmm. just because I think it's better for us to start doing it now and then do better later than wait until it's perfect Uh, because it'll never be perfect Everett, that's my guiding philosophy to never let the perfect get in the way of the good. (laughs) Um, Okay, so if there aren't any other questions, I will seek a motion that the the Wenham Human Rights Commission endorses and supports the indigenous land acknowledgement proposal and encourages the board of selectmen and the school committee to support it as well. Point of order. Yep. are we voting to approve the list of items that Everett has presented to us? My impression is that we are voting to encourage and support Everett's proposal as he brings it forth to both the school committee and the board of selectmen and that the individual details of what will be in that package will be worked out at that level and that we're just here kind of cheerleading and giving our um, support um, to that to that. Okay, thank you. Does that does that make sense? Uh, what well, what are you seeking to clarify, Jeremy? Just, oh, make sure that- just Everett uh, presented a list of items 
and I was hoping, or I was clarifying, are we endorsing their list of items or are we generally saying we think indigenous land acknowledgement at, is a good idea that we want to support? I think it's more specific than that, right? I mean, I think Everett presented something quite clearly and, and we're here to support their, their effort, not an effort, right? So we're, we're trying to be a bit more specific here. Okay. okay. Does that sound right? I'm yeah, so, so let me say it differently. Let me uh, adjust my motion, Janet, and say that the Wenham Human Rights Commission endorses and supports the Indigenous Land Acknowledgement proposal of the Hamilton Wenham Social Justice Club. So that'll encompass everything in Everett's proposal and encourages the Wenham Board of Selectmen and the Hamilton Wenham School Committee to support it as well. Great. So I'm um, looking for a second. So moved. Oh, I already moved well, it. No, oh, I'm looking for a so moved. Before yes. the point of order. Second. No, no, so, so moved. And the second. Yeah. Second. Any discussion? I just have a question. I missed one little phrase in the middle. Okay. So the indigenous land proposal, can you just repeat it for me? It's the middle piece I missed. The indigenous land acknowledgement proposal and encourages the Wenham Board of Selectmen and the Hamilton Wenham School Committee to support it as well. Thank you, got it. Okay, I'm gonna go to a roll call. Sam, all, all in favor? Uh, Sam Nordberg, aye. Pat. Trisha Purdy, aye. Jeremy. Jeremy Gross, aye. Silva. Silva Crystal, aye. Kevin. Kevin DiNapoli, aye. Janet. Janet Bird, aye. And Martha Brennan, aye. Great job, Everett. Thank you for bringing that to us. Excellent. Work. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thanks for having awesome. me. Awesome. And uh, Thanks, Everett. Uh, I don't quite know. Should I stick around? Um, you can if you want to, but feel free to go do your homework. Oh, he <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I, I, I feel that. All right. All right. And Thanks for having me. I'm good. Awesome Bye. job, Everett. Thank you again. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, buddy. All right, the, um, the next item on the agenda, inelegantly named because I wasn't sure how to describe it, but this is the other request from the, from the <laughs> Human Rights Coalition, the discussion of a, of a discussion of a discussion of flags. So Anna, again, you're more articulate than I am in, in bringing this up. Mm, I don't know if that's, that's true. hard to encapsulate in a five word agenda item. It is, and I'll try to be brief too. So this idea has been mulling around the coalition for a while. Um, you know, there is this sort of increasing, um, for lack of better terms, there are flag wars, right? That are happening. People put up Black Lives Matter signs and they put up the thin blue line sign and people, I know at the high school, there've been some issues with people not wanting to say the pledge and what does that mean? And then if you go back to the kneeling of the anthem. So I think it's fair to say that in the last year or so, or even going back a few more years, flag protest has become a complicated, supercharged topic. And one of the things that, again, in a hyper-local way, we'd like to try to get people to talk about in a more respectful, um, understanding way is, what does it mean when a neighbor puts up a Black Lives Matter sign? What does it mean when a high school student doesn't want to say the pledge? What does it mean when someone puts up a back the blue sign? And what does it mean when we see these sort of other symbols? How have they been used in some ways, unfortunately for the police department, how have they been co-opted by others? Um, and we, the coalition, feel like there is a really great conversation to be had in the community that might help us prevent an all out flag war here. Um, because I do think that often when people put these symbols up, they think it means one thing, the people driving around think it means something else. And then there are all these assumptions made. So we kind of wanted to have a structured, facilitated conversation around protest and symbolism and what does it mean very particular to the American flag, Black Lives Matters and um, and the thin blue line flag in particular because those have become so, so supercharged and potentially divisive. So 
we've had a few conversations at our board level and sort of came up the idea that a facilitated conversation with both police chiefs um, and some members of our board. And then I reached out to a moderator, uh, a friend of mine who lives in Manchester, who is a criminal justice and sociology professor at Northeastern, who has done some work in this area, um, has agreed to moderate the panel for us and bring in some sort of professional expertise around some of it. So we'd like to propose um, really Kevin's participation, but also the community awareness but we'd like to get Kevin's buy-in um, because I think especially in our community, we're really lucky to have great police departments, but you know, symbolism does come up and there, there have been some issues and we've had community members have their signs stolen. We've had community members have the word black spray painted out in blue put on it. We've had other members put up a thin blue line flag and then other people assume that they're a white supremacist. And I don't actually think that's necessarily true. So we'd like to have a structured conversation about what this means and how we as a community can try to grow healthily and not have divisiveness. Um, so we would sort of host it and we would, we the coalition would pay for the honorarium to have the professor be the moderator. So really what we're asking for, I guess, is support. And if Kevin is willing to participate on behalf of the Lenin police, uh, we think it could be a really great productive event. Um, and one other thing I'll just add, you know, to say this explicitly, because I think words do matter. The idea would be to be conversational and neighborly. And if you look at the mission of the Human Rights Coalition, it's all about community conversations among neighbors. So not to make it an academic exercise, not to make it a lecture series about people who fly this, mean that, like really make it amongst neighbors and um, sort of remind each other that there are humans behind these flags and symbols and that we can talk to each other and that's okay. So not academic and not divisive, but more um, like a neighborhood. So I think I use the idea of like a neighborhood forum or a neighborhood conversation with a local focus to try to keep it just about the people in our community that we know each other. And I hope that makes sense. Like the spirit of it is not academic or divisive. The spirit is meant to be harmony and community and understanding. And, you know, I won't go into these, but there's, you know, there's a house near me that I know flies the thin blue line flag and I know has blue lights around the house. And I know that it is not an expression of white supremacy. I know that this is true, but it's because I know the family and I know the context and I understand it. And similarly, I have a Black Lives Matter sign in my yard. That does not mean I'm a, an anarchist who wants to destroy the police department. You know, I have that sign for a reason. So I think if we can bring people together to have a better sense of understanding, what I think the community would benefit. I'll stop talking now. <laughs> Kevin, do you have something to say? Uh, no, I, I think it's, I, first of all, I'd be more than honored to be a part of it. And, and so I'm, I'm excited about that. And Pat, you and I have had some, some good talks. And I think there's so much to be learned, you know, and, and I'm constantly trying to, to just ask so many questions to everyone I talk to when it comes up, because it's really changing what I, what I think about things too. And, and I think it's, it's stuff like this to us to have this type of forum, everybody wins as yeah. long as it's, it's in the manner, um, like, like Anna was saying, relative to being respectful and courteous. And we've talked about it at the beginning uh, when we were forming this, this group. And, and I, I just think it's uh, super important uh, and people are going to only move forward, you know, and, and uh, I just, uh, I, I spoke with, uh, or I reached out to Chief Stevens briefly, and I'm pretty confident he wants to be on board as well. So I think it's going to be a super productive uh, night. I say go for it. I don't even think we need to discuss it. <laughs> so I, I have a couple of questions. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Anna, is the idea that the moderated panel will consist of some panelists, but not outside, um, you know, not be open for outside comments or participation? No, I think I think it would. I think we would have panelists uh, that are, you know, uh, people with some subject matter expertise, which is why, again, reaching out to a friend who is knowledgeable, who's not right in the community, but very close. I mean, Manchester is awfully close. Um, I do think there are a couple members of the Human Rights Coalition board that could speak to this that have some knowledge base. I mean, I, I have done some work in around flag protest in general and sort of some historical context and then um, and a couple other members and then the chiefs obviously have authority and subject matter expertise. So I think we would start with a little bit of frameworking 
to set the stage and provide information. But then I do think I would want to encourage members of the community to speak up and share their stories. And hopefully by setting the stage in a place of respectful dialogue, we would avoid people saying terrible things. But again, that's kind of why yeah. having a moderator and the chiefs and everyone there working together um, could be helpful. Again, I don't know, you never know, it might devolve into chaos and we might have to, <laughs> I, I can't predict that, but the idea would be we provide some ideas and some structure and we model, as we're doing right this minute, we model productive, respectful dialogue and then let people from the community share their stories. And um, if people feel uncomfortable speaking in the moment, I think we would solicit um, statements in advance because some of these topics are very difficult. And, um, you know, just, just for, as an example, you know, a lot of people do respond to the thin blue line flag with fear and not just for minorities. Like I will say as a woman, if I see that someone driving around, I immediately make an assumption that they may not see me in a kind, respectful way. And so it's sort of, some people may not want to share their stories. Not everyone is, is as brazen as I am to just wear all of my heart on my sleeves, you know? So I think we could solicit um, stories in advance and we could voice them more anonymously. So well, uh, I think tie, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. I, I was just going to say kind of tying into that, maybe for lack of a better term, maybe a safety net or a filter in place just to kind of, catch anything that we think could propel into a kind of a path we don't want to go down mm -hmm. just kind of if that makes sense I, I, Kevin I think that's a, an excellent an excellent point I've been running these at my um, my healthcare organization which has about 3,500 employees and what I've learned is it takes one person who comes on there with an agenda to derail mm -hmm. to derail the whole thing um, and even, even a really skilled moderator um, can have a really hard time with somebody who's got that on their agenda. And mm -hmm. I'm certainly not even saying that that would be you know, the case for us, but I do think it's good to prepare, particularly for the first one, because you want to put, put a really good foot forward. You want to help people feel comfortable and confident and, and, and you know, like the process. So I, I think having a, an open forum um, opens up to that kind of risk. Whereas people, if people submit their intent beforehand, if they submit their questions beforehand, that really can, can I think help a lot in, in creating a, a, a little bit of a safer mm -hmm. uh, and more controllable forum. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good idea. I mean, that really was our hesitancy was, you know, you just, you can't, you can't predict what people would say and we do agree. So it literally but, takes one. Yeah. Just, I, I have a I have a question since I, about whether the conversation has a goal because I know that and when we were involved as the NAACP with the conversation that happened in Danvers there was a specific request to ask the you know the Danvers town manager had told the fire department to take the flags off of the fire trucks so there was like a point of conflict with that and we don't have that yet which is why we're doing the conversation so that we can build this understanding but i i fear that without a focus and i know that this has come up in top Skilled, it's come up in beverly so there's definitely it's definitely all around us where there's a real you know um conflict when it when it comes up so i'm just wondering how the conversation like what's the ultimate goal at the end what do you, what do you want to get out of this um because people can come and say i believe this and you believe that and and then and then what what well what? actually that 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 actually is the goal the goal is conversation and understanding and not a specific request or a specific um it, so we would be we're putting it under sort of our our adult education bucket um to be more informative and sharing as opposed to we demand the police do that or we demand citizens do this or thou shall never fly this flag again. Like we don't, actually, I don't think we the coalition want to have a specific goal other than conversation to try to, to, try to stay ahead of it and, um, and provide a little bit of context. You know, I think a lot of people don't understand that these symbols have evolved from different places and you know flag protest in general i mean that's a huge topic like we could go far back in history so we're sort of talking about more recent times of like 
where has the current unrest come to? And, you know, one of, for example, one of our board members has uh, a thin blue line flag and a Black Lives Matter sign right next to each other, you know, sort of these dual statements, which works for them, but may not work for everyone. So I, you know, I think the goal actually is just conversation and understanding as opposed to a, like a hard ask. And I wonder, um, sort of following up from Martha's point, I wonder whether it might be worth soliciting stories from those who have put up signs, and in particular, those who have either had their signs altered or taken. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, Joan actually caught somebody taking our sign and I chased them down the street. I and remember that story. I remember, yeah. And it, it changed things a little bit, right? And so I think creating a space for that might be an opportunity. We, you would have to be sure ahead of time that you had people who were reflecting all the different sort of symbols, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but that could be a really interesting way of both sort of really grounding it in something that happened in our community that we certainly on Facebook, you know, had a lot of, of discussion and conversation about. Um, and it would give a more, a more particular goal, I think, maybe of, of sort of harnessing, why did you put those signs out, right? Or, or what, what did it mean to you when those signs were altered? Or, or removed, right? Just to more personalize and humanize the, the community conversation. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good way to vet it because then you sort of have the panelists um, who you know, know better than to inflame. And then if we sort of solicit submissions and if people want to voice those in person, they could. The only thing I would add is there might be some people who have a story that don't actually want to be named personally. Yep. They, yep. they, so as long as we have that sort of caveat. Um, you could have some, some panelists represent those people or read a prepared mm -hmm. statement or something like that. Yeah. So let me ask you guys this as a logical next step because the, we, you know, the, our board has done a lot of thinking on the heads and meetings. This is a really helpful, productive conversation. Would it make sense if we sort of have your generalized idea that maybe a small number of you sort of join like a working group, we can kind of do this together. Cause obviously, you know, I want to hear Kevin's perspective on it, you know, vested person, Sam clearly has like a ton of expertise. And now I'm thinking if our other moderator, like maybe Sam wants to help moderate, <laughs> you know, careful what you're good at, Mr. Norberg, but. Um, I don't know if I'm good at it. I, I mean, geez, it is challenging. It is fraught. Yeah, but I'm just wondering if maybe, cause I, I don't, I think in order for this to be successful, everyone has to feel sort of equal buy-in, if you know what I mean. And so I think that, you know, this conversation I find is really helpful, so. So I, I'm thinking that you would want maybe uh, us and maybe our Hamilton counterparts to co-host or just co-sponsor co like our name on it, just so that it's, and then yeah, that we can, we can have a subcommittee of up to three people Fine. Right, no quorums now, but some, <laughs> something like that, just to have a conversation and see, you know, see where it goes. I mean, I think again, the coalition was, it will sort of be happy to take the lead and sort of make it happen and use our Zoom. Like we can be the host, quote unquote. But if if the town wanted to uh, be supportive, I think that that to me makes yeah. a lot of sense. I feel like we should, um, you know, have a motion that we support mm -hmm. or are willing to co-sponsor. I don't know if you want us as a co-sponsor or. I would uh, love it. I think it shows. Yeah, I mean, that's that's sort of why we built all these things, yeah. municipal, right. other, like, yeah. I also think it could be it could be interesting to see if the town would host using town resources instead. Uh, I guess it changes things, right? It would make it maybe a public and a recorded thing. I, I know it, it changes things. We should also consider recording it. Yeah, and we can do that too. Somewhere you know. for people well, to... we actually, yeah, we actually have a YouTube channel and have put up these recordings. That's where we're going to put our webinars. So, got the, it. Yeah, we're. we're... I, I think that the the coalition's got to got to be the main sponsor, and the yeah. as, the towns as sort of uh, co sponsors, or because then if you want it to be Hamilton and Wenham, you know, sure. if Wenham does it, then it. I don't know. It just. Well, and I just say this again, wearing a hat as someone who is a public official with tax dollars, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is a supercharged topic. And if we, the coalition is sort of the neutral party who don't right. have public funding, bear the brunt of the responsibility, then there might well be people in the town of Wenham who do not want their tax dollars to support mm -hmm. anything to do with this, you know? And I think that that's 
a fair, that's a fair thing. So we're happy to be, that sort of is our role, right? We are the coalition that bridges the two towns and we're happy to do that. But I think frameworking it as a partnership is good, especially because there's a lot of good minds here. And again, you know, the police are a valuable part of it. We don't, we don't want to frame it as anti-police. That's not what it is. We want to get to the point where people feel comfortable with each other. So that's great. Okay. So other other points or can maybe entertain a motion that the Wenham Human Rights Commission endorses and supports a um, forum to be hosted by the Hamilton Wenham Human Rights Coalition on flag protests. And we'll just keep it as neutral as flag protests, mm -hmm. um, unless anyone wants to add wording to that. <clears throat> can someone say so moved? So moved. <laughs> Thanks. Seconded. Seconded. Um, great. So uh, any discussion before I move to, all right, um, I'm going to say all in favor and do a roll call. Sam. Sam Nordberg, aye. Pat. Patricia Purdy, aye. Jeremy. Jeremy Gross, aye. Janet. Janet Burt, aye. Tova. Tova Crystal, aye. Kevin. Kevin DiNapoli, aye. And Martha Brennan, aye. So that's unanimous. Oh, I wish all meetings could be like this. I'm I know, not used right? to these unanimous votes. What's going on? Everyone's agreeing with each other. So no, lovely. Uh, Tom? Yes, uh, Anna, if you're, the coalition needs any assistance from me, please feel free to reach out to me. I, fully I will. I will. Great. So well, before we move on, so obviously Kevin sounds like he's interested. Does anyone else want to help us plan this to make it successful? I mean, Sam, are you willing to help out or Jeremy or... To, or as long as it's not a quorum, I think you can, we can have some more help if you want. Yeah, I, I, I'd be very happy to. I would too, Anna. Yeah, okay. me too, Anna. Well, unless someone else wants to. Jeremy, well, would you, you, you wanted to or no? Yes, Jeremy. Jeremy wants to? Okay. All right, so I'll pick up Kevin, Sam, and Jeremy to our sort of planning group. And that right. way you guys don't have a quorum and we know there's a buy-in. And then Tom, if there's logistical support or other things, we'll, you know, we'll oh, let you know. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so the last two items on the agenda, Anna, are you gonna stay? I can stay because one of those was ours too, yeah. that bias request one. Well, and actually that had come up, uh, Tova had actually brought that up independently. So, um, this next item and the last item are really sort of works in progress, if you will. So we're going to bring it up for discussion, but there's definitely got to be some work and possibly um, for this next one, a, a subcommittee. But um, Anna, you could maybe take us back to last fall when there was a motion at the school committee discussing anti-bias training and just let us know where you guys are and then Tom, I don't know if there's any been any discussion at the town level for employees, but this is one of our charges as a committee is to recommend policy changes and, and trainings that might be appropriate that would advance the causes of human rights for, for town employees. So this is the very initial toe in the water for that. Tova had brought it up, Anna had brought it up to me. So, you know, let's not stop any momentum. Let's start talking about this. And I don't know if that means we start I, I want it to be more than just the Human Rights Commission says, yes, we support anti-bias training. Like I want us to do some more research or do something more active to, to advance this the, rather than just raise our hand and say, yes, we'll take one of those. That's my perspective. <laughs> I'd like to hear more of that because since I've been here, I haven't heard any discussion regarding uh, this training and I'd be very interested in hearing where it's coming from and the background and so forth. All right, so Anna, why don't you tell us the story from the school committee side of it? Cause that's a bunch of employees and then we can talk about- um... Um, Yeah, well, I wanna be careful here because I'm not here on behalf of the school committee. Um, right. So um, just to, you know, just to clarify. So um, I can tell you what's been happening there but I'm not doing so as a member of the school committee. Okay, and then- that makes sense. Yeah. And after you, then Tova also had brought it up. So maybe. Tova yeah, totally. Yeah. So, I mean, for context, the, the, you know, um, well, and it's, so I sort of have two thoughts on this. I mean, 
as the Human Rights Coalition is something we have been pressing the, the school district to do um, and is something that's important. I mean, it's, it's pretty much standard onboarding almost everywhere. I bet everyone on the screen has done it in some form or another, but I don't know that it's been made official by the towns or the school district. So um, it, it first came up at a school district level last, uh, last summer. It was part of an anti-racism resolution that talked about um, annual training. So we talked about it there. We did talk about it very recently, um, just last week. We had sort of a training and the school committee has adopted some next steps to talk about it. So I would say what I'm comfortable saying there is that it's also in process. There's been a lot of conversation about the need for it. Um, interestingly, Again, back to back to the youth, I say the youth are of the future. So our youth coalition subcommittee wrote a letter and I think it had over 130 signatures, I want to say, that we presented to the school committee. Uh, but again, sort of like Everett's presentation, uh, Olivia Solman, who's the chair of our youth education subcommittee, presented it. She wrote it. Um, it's it was amazing. So she has put forth that request. Uh, there was a follow-up meeting with the superintendent and the high school principal with members of the coalition um, itself sort of motivating this. So I would say on the school side, the coalition has been agitating, the committee has been agitating as part of that resolution. And now where we are is it's, it is a work in progress at the district level um, and they're sort of next step. So at our meeting last week, we resolved to uh, I think the superintendent was sending out a survey of teachers about sort of their bandwidth, about when they would do it. And then the committee has scheduled a follow-up conversation about defining equity for the district and maybe having some professional training come in um, at a district level about our next steps. So that's what I can say about the school committee status of it. Um, but what I will say and sort of offer, you know, um, anecdotally in the coalition, we were hearing lots of stories from students in the district, um, but also members of the community as well. And, you know, the, the recent situation in Wenham provides a really good example of, of where bias training might be helpful to municipalities. So um, it's really driven from a fact of, of recognizing the first step in making sort of a truly inclusive community is to recognize the, the bias, the baggage that we bring. And anyone who says they don't have bias is just like people who say they don't have mice in their house like everyone has mice in their house you know <laughs> you just may not want to admit it out loud so um for us as a coalition it's sort of an important next step and we definitely encourage the school district and also both municipalities to make this sort of standard practice for all town employees but also all board members you know everyone if they're going to make decisions about policy should be coming at it from a similar framework so i don't know if that's quite what you wanted me to say but that's what i can say about it You're muted, Martha. I am. Sorry, um, that provides some useful background. I guess I have a question before I ask Tova um, where, you know, what she was thinking when she when she had mentioned it to me is, has the school identified specific anti-bias training that they want the teachers to take? Or is it just at the conceptual level, thou shalt? It's right at the school district level. Um, it is conceptual. The coalition, again, Olivia did a lot of work and has done some research up about particular vendors and trainings and programs. And these days it's very fashionable. I mean, there are a million different flavors of bias training one could take at different price points, different focuses. So at present, the district has not identified a specific training or trainer um, that's going to be budget dependent and time dependent and sort of other things. So the answer is uh, no, but there are a lot of ways you could do it. Tova, did you want to say anything? Yeah, I definitely can. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I was kind of thinking of it um, just from the perspective of like, we were talking, you know, there's a lot of talk about this idea of like ending racism, ending bigotry. And I think that like, I was at first kind of like, well, how, how do these things end? And, you know, I think that just like this, like people have to go through these kinds of things and come at it. Like we can, in, you know, we can put up these lists of books for people to read and do all these things. But like, um, you know, when somebody works for a town, that's actually a place that you can say in order for you to work for us, you have to examine these things um, about yourself and you have to understand, uh, you know, the world that you're living in. And so I think that it, it just is like, it would be such a missed opportunity for um, the town to not offer that and to um, 
and to, you know, encourage that and require that. Um, so I like, like I, somebody said, I'm sure we've all undergone these, like, yeah, I did a few of them, um, in college. Like I've done a few different types of like microaggression and bias, um, trainings, like privilege trainings and stuff like that. Um, and I've done, I worked at a place that we did like bi-monthly, um, dismantling racism in the workplace, like sessions. And I just think that, um, I'm really interested in pursuing that with town employees and, I haven't done the research yet um, to see specifically what vendors are in the area. I'm familiar with ones like within the Northeast, but not specific to Massachusetts. Um, so I, it sounds like maybe the coalition has some resource on that. I'd be happy to look into that too for the committee if we were interested in um, kind of having that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of just my thought process behind it at least. So Anna, can I ask a question? No. Um, so this <laughs> so this sounds like it's a best practices kind of thing when all is said and done, right? Absolutely. I mean, so, yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, sadly, Wenham does not have a, an HR department or whatever. I don't know if the schools do, but are you seeing this as three different, um, you know, like Hamilton, Wenham, and then the school committee all going their own separate ways on this? You're not seeing this as everybody because every town should have its own, you know. Yeah, I, I would I would argue, and this came up in our conversation with the superintendent, the, the coalition's conversation is, you know, there are community trainings that we're trying to do through our adult education platform. Mm -hmm. But the, your, the word you just used was actually just the right one. I mean, this is best practice. This is yeah. in every, every museum I've worked in, every yeah. board, every, I mean, it is like yeah. part of your onboarding. Absolutely. Like you, and you have to sign that you receive. It's like, so to me, it's sort of, um, you know, it's just, it is something that the for-profit and non-profit worlds right. have been doing literally for decades. I think I've yeah. been doing bias training for like yeah. 20 years. So I feel like it should be built into each municipality. And frankly, like it's not something that I think the district or either town should rely on an outside body to do. Like, no, this I is, agree. This yeah. is a, to me, it's a statement about values. Yeah. I also will say, Tom will appreciate this. At one time I worked for the town of Essex and got familiar with sort of the MIA in terms of like an insurance overview. I have to think it'd be helpful for municipal liability insurance protection that you're mm -hmm. saying, like you're trying to offer this training because, yes. you know, you want to try to get ahead of these issues before they become big problems. So I have to think in terms of like governance, it's good to say like, yes, we as a town have, yeah. you know, provide and mandate this training for everyone who serves on our boards and works in our town. And, you know, it's, yeah. It's penny wise and dollar foolish if you don't have it. <laughs> right. It's, it's similar to the way they were offering, you know, open meeting law training. Yeah. Uh, it's a, I do want, sorry go ahead just to that point I do feel like there is a hierarchy in these types types of things and I think that there can be like a performative aspect to them that like there are a lot of trainings that you can do that unless you genuinely care about it as an individual and are trying to get the most out of it you're clicking through slides and you're clicking just through it and like we did that for instance like for my college we all went through it every year and it was not taken seriously in a lot of ways and I could imagine oh, Toby, oh we, we lost you, you Tova Tova you muted yourself we lost you we lost you we can't hear you Something happened. I don't see that. Her oh, earbuds. She, she touched her earbuds. Oh, oh. Oh, okay. Didn't you hear me? Yes. Yeah, now we can. Sorry. Um, so just, I would just want to be conscious that like, if we're going to, this is something the town would uh, like spend money on and stuff that it, it isn't just um, a slideshow that it, town employees no. have to do to check off the box of mm -hmm. yes, they had to do this and mm -hmm. that it would be like a meaningful um, experience, hopefully. I think, I think that's a critical point. My, my deepest concern here is that the evidence-based bashing, can you please pull up? Thank you. Just <laughs> pull up your pants, buddy. Thanks. That's the best part of the meeting. Is I, I know, there. I know. <laughs> Um, is that the evidence base for anti-bias training is not very strong. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, that's, even that's in, my problem. Even in, even in controlled trials where there has been a lot of adherence to specific protocols, a lot of thought put into them. Um, and, you know, the things that appear to increase the likelihood of anti-bias training working are that it's sustained for a long period of time, that it integrates with your normal work um, and, and with your normal incentives, that it doesn't feel like an extra mandate that's sort of layered on top, but feels integral to your position. Um, and so one of my concerns is that a lot of the vendors that I've seen out there have a lot of flash, they've got a lot of great slides and videos and stuff like that. But like those sustained approaches, I think actually require a sort of a, a core within the system mm -hmm. who are prepared to champion mm -hmm. that effort from the from sort of the ground up. So I, mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not confident that finding the right vendor A yeah, is possible, but B is sufficient. I think that there there's got to be, you know, and Toby, you put it you put it really well that like for people who are already inclined to think in this way and are open to their own bias, these trainings can work. They can be helpful. Um, right. But for, for for people who aren't aware or aren't interested in becoming aware, it's it's not going to work. Um, and so I, I think I think it's incumbent on us to think about the right way to do this. Um, and I'm I'm nervous about a lot of the vendors out there. I mean, there are smart people out there trying to make a quick buck on, mm -hmm. you know, flashy, beautiful, you know, diversity training. Um, well, and so, Sam, I, I would say one of the things that's nice though about this group is that there is a group within that can champion it now, but hadn't existed before. So I think, you know, one of the charges of the group, I think, is to sort of recommend ongoing policy and training and initiative. So I think this would fall into that and you could find a way to, you know, start here, maybe next year it's that. And, and um, you know, the idea that it's going to be evolving. I mean, I think just in the last two years, people's consciousness has been raised. The number of conversations I've had with people who have previously identified as very progressive, open-minded thinkers, but have this blind spot about structural inequality has fascinated me. And now all of a sudden everyone's like, oh my gosh, structural racism is here. And it's like, right, well, how did you not see that before? Mm -hmm. But that's true, like that is the truth. Like all of a sudden something is happening. And so I think if you give yourself room to grow into it and see what the next the next wave of new thinking is, I think that that could be really powerful. And, and yeah, the other thing I will say to Sam's point, I think you're right, you can get people to come in and do trainings, but I think fundamentally it has to be part of your local government, you know, with best practices so that there are consequences within the town government that will, you know, you could lose your job. <laughs> If you're not well, I mean that that actually Pat that that actually doesn't have a lot of evidence behind it either that when they're mandated and, and it feels punitive, um, our natural <laughs> tendency is to is to reject and to figure out how to conform to the requirements, but it actually doesn't generate change. The the true generators of change would be that Kevin becomes a champion for his Oh yeah, clearly. Right? And that, I, that I, Kevin I, by I, leading from the front would would generate that change and so if if what we want to do is is bring in outside expertise it's got to be outside expertise that's got very strong championing and um and sort of people who are who are embracing it leading from the front in all of the departments that we intend to impact so are you saying that you don't think uh, for instance an hr person that represents the town wouldn't be um, you know, someone who could be there for people to go to. to really? Sufficient. No, you'd need to see the people that you work alongside on a daily basis making changes or else it just won't stick. No, I, I realize that, but you still have to have someone there to explain what the best practices are and make sure that people are aware of them. I mean, I don't know. I just communities that I know that have HR, an HR person seem to be able to keep you know, everybody, that's the place to go, I guess. So Tom, you don't agree. <laughs> go ahead, Tova. 
Okay. So I, um, obviously like this would need to be looked into a lot and I do. So I did some work with, um, clean water action in Boston a few years ago and we, they had this dismantling racism in the workplace. Um, and it was not a training that somebody else came in and did. They actually like paid like part of their job was two of their employees who worked for them in other aspects were yeah. as part of their job took on, they went through the training mm -hmm. and they learned how to facilitate this. And so twice a month that we all met in the conference room and they kind of presented it, but it was among peers and it yeah. was, you know, mm, yeah. exactly what Sam is saying. And I think something like that, it's not, that's exactly kind of my point. It's not this one-time thing mm -hmm. that you do. It's this ongoing education and self-examination among your peers in the workplace. Um, and I would be interested in, in trying to recommend or, or start something like that personally. So, so Tom, tell us a little bit about um, how, how HR works in the town if we don't have HR. <laughs> okay. I know I'm sure that's a sensitive subject, but you're amongst friends. No, it's not a sensitive subject. <laughs> I'll always be honest with you because I know <laughs> on this. Um, you need, we need a 16 hour, at least 16 hour HR person, individual here. Yeah. Um, but going back to what Tova and Anna are speaking, um, and it's kind of interesting what Sam was saying was, it's you know, coming from the bottom up, but you need to have the support from the top down mm -hmm. to drive this, to force it. I'm probably only gonna be here maybe another two and a half months. I'd love to be here as long as you'd want me here, but I know they're going through the process of selecting an administrator um, I mean, I don't know how much experience that she or he will have in this, but I know when you're trying to do this, you need the support of the board, you need the support of the manager, and I think it was Tova was saying this, this is not a one-time 30-day process. Mm -hmm. Right. This is an ongoing, continuous process that you have on a basically timetable with steps with measurable areas of what you're being training, what you're working on, and seeing how it affects what it does. It's not just bring someone in here, sit here for a two hour session and figure you're done. Mm -hmm. It's not that. Yeah. It's seeing what difference it has made. Uh, this is a smaller town for me. I've worked and managed towns of upwards of 25 and 26,000, where it's a much bigger issue where you have a more diverse, and I'm not saying diverse as far as uh, backgrounds and such, just diverse in philosophies of what how people feel. And it's a little more challenging to do that. Uh, an HR person, I think it was Patricia was mentioning it. Mm -hmm. The HR person pretty much would be, would be setting schedules for this. They probably on a part-time basis would not be the drivers. The drivers of it would be the person in my position or myself and the select board, whether it's three or five members. They're the ones, we're the ones who are setting the policy. We're the ones who are, you know, pushing this forward. And I think it has to come from there. I mean, I'm fully supportive of that, but I also understand it's not somebody just coming in, doing a two hour session and moving on to one of the other 350 cities and towns. And it's gotta be followed up and continued. And if people have questions or concerns, you need to address that with them so that it's just not thought that it's um, lip service that you're giving them on that. Yes, Anna, you gotta unmute. Yeah, yeah I know, I was being polite. Um, what I was gonna say to kind of, um, and I know that as much as we sort of tease about all these flag things and requests and all these things, this is where the other thing too, is that if it's, if the, the training is part of a whole body of work that is about broadening minds and representation. So I also think it's important to remember that, you know, the other things that committee is gonna do in terms of bringing in these topics, you know, best practices in policing, best practices in municipal HR, best practices in 
you know, seniors, like when the, when this body was created, there was an idea, you know, there's an element of housing, there's an element of senior care, there's an element of all these other things. So to me, the training is one kind of like low hanging basic fruit, but yes, not done as a one and done. It's not an isolation, but recognizing that it's part of this whole other body of work that you guys are talking about doing other policies, other trainings, educational events, representational events, you know? So I think to me, the, the trainings that I've been really successful with. And I love the fact that Tova brought up Clean Water Action because one of my very best friends from college is the executive director of Clean Water Action. She's an amazing human. So just shout out to Clean Water yes, Action. Yes. She's amazing. Um, but, you know, that sort of integration of training with regular work, with outside partnerships, with representational acts, like it's all then it gets into the consciousness into, I think, Sam's point, then it becomes subconscious. So it's almost like you rewire, like right now we're wired to have these biases. You can unlearn the biases and start to have a consciousness of like, wow, how can I be consciously inclusive in everything that I do? And I think that ultimately would be the goal. And then you won't have these accidental missteps where someone says something inappropriate, judges something, denies something, you know, it becomes you can retrain our, we can retrain our brains to look at the world differently if it's part of a cohesive body of work. So just want to throw that out there. I think that's really well said. I, I think if I can, if I can try and sum up sort of my position, at least, this does not feel like a, a place to endorse a one-off thing. This feels like a place where we get to say, we consider this to be like the oversight of this kind of work to be part of our ongoing mandate. Um, this is not a one and done. Like, yes, we should do training. We have to be all over this. Like we need to be working to develop champions, vetting the, the kinds of trainings that we're doing and revisiting these things year after year to make sure that they're actually accomplishing the goals that we think they should be accomplishing. I think, I think that that's what this feels like more to me. I, I agree, Sam. I was going to say that we need to have some kind of measurable outcome to not just just say we're going to have this training but it sounds like we need to do a little more legwork with tom what you know what trainings are offered now what what are the possibilities if tova you you know i think i kind of feel like we need a little subcommittee action we can reach out to um olivia on from the coalition and talk with Tom and figure out what's there, see if, if we're gonna get an HR person. I do think it makes sense probably to wait to do the training until we get the new person. Cause you know, we wanna, we wanna take this through the board of selectmen, which isn't full right now. Like we're kind of in a, we're in a little bit of an interregnum here where not all the people are in place that need to drive this forward. So it doesn't make sense for us to charge down the right. hill if the generals are still figuring out, you know, who's in what seat, so to speak. So, well, and I would offer to remember that, um, and this was sort of the conclusion the school district came to, is the school district is well behind of where the rooms should be. The municipalities are behind. This is not actually new novel ground. You know, there are municipalities that have been doing this that have diversity officers, that have people. Mm -hmm. I feel like a little bit of outreach to other communities to say, how right. have you successfully, like, find a town that's doing it well and look at what they've done and ask for advice because we don't have to make it up as we go. And I'm sure Kevin in the policing world, I mean, yeah, there's, gotta be ton. There, there's a ton of stuff going. It's like, this is, I mean, not to belittle the importance, like, but this is old news. Like um, this, is, this doesn't have to be new content because it's totally, I mean, it's been around for a while. So it's more a matter of like, how do we integrate these best practices in a municipal setting, in a policing setting, learning from people who've done it successfully before us so you might be able to get help from someone who's done it well already from an, a municipal point of view so from a from a next steps perspective feels like we need to do a little research maybe have some conversations with tom do does anybody else want to work on this with tova can i just can i ask anna is there is there an explicit ask like is there a need right now for something from us that would help you guys move forward in your mission? Or is it okay if we take a bit more time to percolate on this? No, I, that, that's the, the ask was, could you please start thinking about it? We think it's an important thing to do. And, um, you know, again, we might do something for the community that's more community focused around layers of bias. And, you know, one of the adult ed programs we've talked a lot about 
which is directly applicable to our demographics is sort of really unpacking white privilege and, um, and, you know, sort of white bias. So like that particular content is one of many forms of bias. So I think the coalition will be doing some programming around that, but that's more community focused. I feel like there's a different attachment to like elected officials and boards and, and, you know, policing. So no, there's no specific ask, just that that we think it's something important. We'd like the town to start really thinking on it. And we'll be doing some programming in and around it on different issues. Um, I think we have a nine part webinar series between youth and adult ed covering housing, disability, indigenous rights, white privilege. Uh, we've talked about this policing forum a little bit. Um, so, you know, we've got a huge, uh, we've got a big agenda <laughs> that we're gonna do kind of on the community side, but I think that content is different than in a municipal application. So, and again, buy-in matters, like it matters when the town itself does it and puts money to it and, uh, you know, uh, the towns have to own it in their own special way. Great, okay, so I, I feel like we can take this as a, um, like a research project so that when the, all the people are in place, new selectmen, new town manager, you know, we can have like a, a, a to-do list for them. That sound good? Yeah, I think it needs to wait. I mean, you know, till more people are in place. Right, but I think we can do some of the legwork yeah. now. Oh, yeah. And um, I'd be happy to work with Tova. Uh, on it too, to split up the work and just, you know, you and I can connect offline if, and if anyone else is interested in, in doing that, we'll, we can hit Tom up for some info just in terms of town structure and, and stuff. I think that would be good. Great. Okay. Awesome. okay. All right. Um, okay. Uh, so. Martha, is it okay if I take my lead from you? I'm sort of yes. due over in Hamilton Board of Selectmen, but I wanted to be here for all the yes. things we talked about. So. Um, Thank you, Anna. Thanks, Anna. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your time. And I'll be in touch with Kevin, Sam, and Jeremy specifically about the flag planning okay. conversation and keep your posted. Sounds good. So, great. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. All right. So, in the interest of time, I'm sure everybody's anxious um, to move on to their next Zoom meeting. <laughs> Actually, I hope you don't have another Zoom meeting tonight. <laughs> but um, so, as we discussed last time, we have updated the town website, our page on the town website. We have the an intake form, thanks to Tova. We have the email address. We have the process flow is on there. Um, we've got the Zoom link. We'll have our minutes and our agenda, but we're sort of working to make, and this, we're working to make the website um, useful to people. So in looking at a lot of the other uh, human rights municipal websites, there's often a resource list. And that is a rabbit hole that Pat and I went way down. And, you know, there are hundreds of lists of, of things. And it's kind of like this anti-bias training conversation, right? There's work that we all need to do as individuals. And then there's work that, you know, you can do as a town. And there's a lot of different, you know, especially since we're a broader organization, we're not just anti-racist, but we're all of the different ways that people are discriminated against. So, um, this is kind of a, I'm wondering what you guys think. I mean, we can definitely put some resources up there. And I think I sent you guys a draft, which is sort of like a combination, but it's, it's really endless. I liked the idea of having one or two things per kind of main topic. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if people would actually go to the town website and say, you know, how do I get you know, I'm food insecure, I need this help, I need, you know, a, a shelter, I, I've been discriminated, I don't know, I, so I'm just sort of opening it up to um, how we think we can best serve the, the town, like, should we just edit this resource list and put it up there, and one of the things I liked about some of the lists is there were not just books, but podcasts, and TED Talks, and movies, so that it, you could get people at different places. So, I don't know, what do you think? Is this like ins two inside baseball and just do what you want? <laughs> Actually, my, my thinking is that we would be better off providing links to those other sites rather than taking that stuff that maybe we haven't completely read through or completely digested and putting it on our page as if it's ours. Um, that it's, we can provide access to the same resources 
through those other pages. Um, but I, I worry a little bit about not vetting all the materials and then and then putting them on our page and sort of giving them a tacit endorsement. Yeah, I mean, there's there's some things like looking at some of the pages. There's like, for example, white fragility is listed on some of the pages, and there's some real problems with Robin D'Angelo and what she's doing with her business based around. Uh, her book that give me some concern. It's a huge bestseller. She's turned that into a corporate training program, but the program that she's come up with has been criticized by people of color and different groups. And so, yeah, I think, you know, there, I, in preparation for this, I made a big list of books that I would want on the list. And then I realized I'd really just gone down a rabbit hole. Like there's just so exactly. many books that I would recommend to people and they're books I've read. So I vetted them, but I don't know if everyone in the group is going to read, you know, 500 page books on different topics and stuff. It's, and, and maybe this you know. ties in with Anna's, Anna Seisnick's goal of setting, you know, creating more of a community dialogue around doing this work. Right, like that's I do a Tuesday night, you know, sort of encounters group around this, and there's nothing better for expanding your knowledge and challenging you and and working through some of your own your own stuff. So, you know, uh, I, I hear what you're saying. We do we've done some really good book discussions with our NAACP chapter too, and it it really is in that the conversation that you get to the to the good stuff, um, but. Uh, well, so then Pat also had come up with a list of like sort of other organizations. That would be another another way um, to use some of our um, real estate, so to speak, on our web page to you know for people to access directly. Um, you know whether it's Massachusetts anti discrimination or I don't have the list in front of me, Pat. But um, well, it was things like. Um... Project Bread for food and stuff. I tried to touch the main topics, like, uh, you know, um, one that's fabulous is the Mass Department of Mental Health Human Rights Handbook. I think that, I mean, it's just fabulous. And, uh, you know, then there's the United States Commission of Civil Rights, and I've got the, um, you know, the email addresses, and maybe that's all we have to do. You know, I mean, I think there are enough other play, or just list the public library if you're interested in you know, books. There were some awesome podcasts, though, that dealt with, um, you know, domestic violence discussion, which was outstanding. I watched all these things just so I wasn't recommending LGBTQ. Um, it's called The Nation. It's an official podcast that was, I found very good. So I don't know. I think this is too, I think overall we have too much. But the other the other idea that Pat had was to try to get um, the, the sort of book list um, curated by the Hamilton Women Library and that we just linked them. And then- I love that idea. And then, yeah, and yeah, then and that bring, yeah. And then just put the organization things um, on. Well, I just think it's more efficient to just give people, you know, if you're looking for food and secure ways to, you know, to overcome food insecurity, you don't want to have to go through 5,000 links to get there. You know, maybe we should just pick some main topics to start with, uh, you know, provide the ways to link, and then we can add things as we find something fabulous that we want to add. Yeah, that's probably, I think. Yeah, also, I don't, I don't know if people are going to be looking up the, the Hamilton or the Wenham Human Rights Committee for issues related to food insecurity. Like, I don't, I don't think, I think that's a little bit of, like, I worry that that's a little bit of scope creep. Like, yes, there's yeah. absolutely correlation there for sure. Yeah. Um, well, I, yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, I think Martha had said she wanted to do, you know, touch on other topics. Didn't you, Martha? I, I was just thinking of, you know. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm trying to envision. By, I'm enchanted by the idea of using our local library as a mm -hmm. resource for, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. And that's all we have to, on yeah. Just say that. And, and, and bias. And I think that's a fantastic mm -hmm. idea. All right. So Pat, we got to, we have to tag team the librarian and, and try to. I'll do that. 
I'll kind of push back. that because if we could link to a um, you know a human rights resource list that they that they vetted, and then yeah. we'll we'll go through these um, organizations that we think are kind of maybe the top three or top five reasons people might um, yeah. visit the website. I think that that would probably be good. I'm also wondering um, if there's anything with just in light of our pre the presentation tonight, like if there's anything like a link to the Massachusetts tribe website that we might want to also put up um, something. I, I don't know if that's really, but it just seems I've like gone to look for information before about like indigenous land that we're on. And it's like kind of hard to find, like it's not super obvious. So maybe we could do something like that. Would that be better put on the when uh, the you know the wonderful world of Wenham just as something that you know like a post from our group to say hey you might be interested in knowing this is how you get you know as opposed to as uh, Sam said you know putting things about food insecurity maybe that's not something we do but we could we could post it as a offshoot of you know just something that would inform the community. I don't know. We don't have a way to post from a social media account, though, do we? Didn't As we talk entity? about doing that, though? From um, I mean, we could make a we could make our own Wenham Human Rights Commission thing, but I don't know that we have anyone who wants to like manage our social media account. We can yeah. jump on the local Facebook pages. Um, I just I just don't think we're gonna build a following. Okay. But you know what? I, I like Tova's idea about the land acknowledgement thing. Janet, when you do the minutes, can you attach? Um, if we ask Everett for their presentation, we could attach it to the minutes, right? And then it would be, we're going to have the minutes posted on the website. Just, a, you know, it's a way to get the information out there. If people were looking at it, what is this about? And then they can click into their presentation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that so idea. I can reach out to him and just make sure we have the slides. All right, I see everyone's getting antsy. So um, unless there's other topics. Um, let's... I'm so sorry, I've, I just have a quick question. Yeah. Was, was legal counsel available and then we lost their time? Is that what happened? No, it, it was worse than that. So now you're gonna make me admit it. I was so, I had it on my list for um, to put it on the agenda. And then when Anna sent me all of the things to add, I, I forgot to put it back on. So I have it. I've already started my April 4th agenda. And yeah, put it on the April agenda. So I, awesome. will, I will take the fall for that. Oh, like, no, it happens to the best of us. <laughs> you know, and I had that nagging feeling I was forgetting something, but I'm like, oh, my God, I got like 10 items on this list. Like, they're going to kill me. I, and then, <laughs> oh, yeah, the lawyer's available. And I was like, ah. Sam, she will be available at your next meeting. We've already. Okay, yeah. And like, oh, great. I started the, um, cause that is important. We do have to have that discussion about what's confidential and what's mandated reporting. And but Martha, I would even go beyond that. If any board, any committee members have any further questions besides that, please get that to Martha so she can put that on the agenda. Yeah, good. All right, so um, if there's nothing else, I can adjourn the meeting. And we'll see you guys next month. Till I'll, I'll reach out to you and Pat. We can touch base too on the, yeah. the book thing. Okay. I believe we need a motion to adjourn. Oh, yes. <laughs> go moved. A second. I'll second. I'll second. <laughs> Sam Nordberg, I. Just pretty I. Jeremy Gross, I. Tova Crystal, I. Anna Bird, I. Kevin DiNapoli, I. And Martha Brennan, I. And you guys almost went in order. That's really cool. <laughs> We're learning. <laughs> Night, everyone. All right. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.